Articles of Faith is a weekly interview show featuring scholars and writers who have written about the doctrines and teachings of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Articles of Faith is a production of Fair Mormon and is hosted by Nick Galletti. Margaret Blair Young was raised in the church and learned the standard Mormon cliches and customary phrases of a Mormon testimony. As a child, she could imitate the strokes of expressions of Mormonism well. In time, she came to understand these were expressions of an immature, inexperienced faith. Time propelled her further in the faith. In time, she began to be immersed in controversial areas of LDS history, including race issues and the priesthood restriction, and keeping those of African lineage from receiving the priesthood or temple blessings for over a century. She wrote three books and made three documentaries on these subjects with Darius Gray, a black man who joined the church in 1964, 14 years before the priesthood restriction was lifted. Margaret is the past president of the Association for Mormon Letters and has published eight books, novels, and short stories. Three of these were co-authored with Darius and gave the history of Black Latter-day Saints. She and Gray also made the documentary Nobody Knows the Untold Story of Black Mormons. She has written six encyclopedia articles and other scholarly papers on blacks in the Western USA and particularly on black Mormons. She also used to teach creative writing at BYU in their English department for, was it 30 years, you said? 30 years. 30 yeah. years. So welcome, Margaret Blair Young. Thank you very much. Great for to be here. In. So I understand that you actually just got back from Africa. Where were you and what were you doing there? Oh, I was having the most wonderful time. Uh, back... 2005-ish, my husband and I were in the MTC uh, with the French-speaking branch. I'm not, I don't speak French yet. I'm learning. My husband does. And uh, I, I actually longed to have a missionary son. Uh, my, my oldest son is not active in the church. So I kind of became a missionary mom to every single young man yeah. who was sent to the DR Congo. Uh, I, I adopted them, and I, I was an amazing missionary mom. I <laughs> sent candy and cookies and brownie mixes, uh, labeling them elder fuel so that it wouldn't be candy nice. or food so that it would actually get through to them. And not only did I write to them, but I wrote to their companions and had miraculous experiences where mm -hmm. I would meet family members, of, especially of the companions, or get more of the story. And, and that ultimately uh, brought me to... Having a whole family, and we're still we're still family. All of these kids I wrote to, and the African companions, we're all still family. But uh, one, Emmy Mbuyi, who had been a revolutionary before he joined the LDS Church, got married in August, and we were already scheduled to make a film there, and had the funds to to go and and do B roll and location scouting. We also filmed the bride price ceremony, another little ritual with the marriage, the civil ceremony, which because they only perform civil marriages on three days during the week, you have like 20, 30 really? couples who are gathered there. It's and a mass wedding? Actually, except each couple is asked to stand, face each other, okay. uh, exchange vows, and then they go up to the front with the magistrate. I was I was one of the witnesses, and they show their rings to, to the crowd gathered there and give a, a timid little kiss. <laughs> uh, and and then sign more papers and they're married. Of course, my objective was to get them to a temple. Sure. And we were not able. South Africa is not allowing Congolese to go to the temple right now. It's been about four months since they've allowed any Congolese to go into South Africa. So we failed after multiple attempts. We failed to get to the South Africa temple. So as that we, I started seeing. Okay, that guy's job is to say no, and he's mm. going to find all sorts of creative ways to say no. We can't accept your application. He will not say we're not letting Congolese in. He'll say no. There was a clerical error, you know. So I finally said, find out about Ghana. Let's yeah. let's consider Ghana. We were Dane or Gerald, my my director and, and star of the film. We were already going to Ghana because we were going to film the slave castle Elmina there. So uh, we took Emmy and Steffi with us, and they were sealed in the Ghana temple. Very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your film a little later, because I think there's a lot there that we can talk about. But um, other than that, how is the church doing in Africa? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I said to one of my—a lot of the people who have just been coming into my life, I said, I understand that there are people, walk, hundreds of people, walking all sorts of distances just to get baptized. And sometimes they can't because there has to be a center of strength within 25 miles. And the man said, oh, no, not hundreds, thousands. 
these people who are traveling these huge distances are having dreams and visions. Mm. Uh, This is not, let's see if we can join an American church and then maybe get a benefit. This is people who are spiritually yearning for something that they've been instructed about. One, One of these missionaries who we had in the MTC I asked him about some of the people who would come to the church seeking it, and and he said there, there was this one guy who uh, showed up, and he said, I know I'm supposed to be here. And he had found it himself, which was kind of amazing because he was blind. Uh, wow. That's just there, – there are just so many. But so my husband and I know that when we go, and it's a when, not an if, that, that we we become a center of strength. The, the missionaries who we've talked to, we talked to Michael Moody, who uh, helped open Gabon. And uh, he, he's the one who did the, the church handbook back in 85. Wow. Uh, but they, they would not be able to baptize everybody in one setting who wanted to be baptized. So they would baptize 30 at a time, wash the baptismal clothes, and prepare for the next baptism. Uh, that's what's happening in Africa. And retention from the, the fact that I know all of these young men who served in the Republic of Congo, the, uh, in Cameroon, uh, and in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, retention rate is 80 or 90 percent. That's how well the church wow. is doing in Africa. That's incredible. It is incredible. That's better than most places, isn't oh, it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Excellent. But on a day-to-day basis, what are some of the challenges that they face um, do they do they have doctrinal questions? Or are they? Is it more just life situation type of oh, struggles? Life, life situation, sure. Uh, you know, it's a third world country, but we still are dealing with a lot of stereotypes about Africa. Uh, th- th- there are people imagine what African life is like in a way that is entirely inaccurate. I went to a talk two days ago by a Congolese woman who is actually very powerful now in African affairs and said that a bishop who was welcoming an African person uh, in, in, into, she was doing something in Arizona, and he said, I know that you don't actually wear clothes in, in your country, so I'm so glad that people were able to get clothes for you. And this was recent, the hmm. idea that, that people still have a National Geographic picture of <laughs> yeah. what Africa is like. In fact, <laughs> Another missionary story. My my dear Kendall Coburn, I just I just love this young man. Uh, I'll even detour a little. When we were in Africa, Emmy, my my Congolese friend, took me to the distribution center and and uh, some of the church offices. And there were there was a group of missionaries that were finishing. They were going to end their missions the very next day. And I met one of these missionaries, whose whose name was Jean Claude Olama. I remembered it because I thought one letter short of Obama, Olama, <laughs> and. Uh, and he said that he was from Cameroon. And, of course, a lot of my missionaries, I call them my missionaries, my adopted son, served there. And so I started the names. Did you know Elder Coburn? And his face lit up, and he said, he baptized me. Mm. And then I you know, I Facebook messaged when I had internet. I said, Kendall Coburn, the circle is complete. Kendall told me, he called me later and said, I was going to tell you about Elder Olama, but I knew he was in a different place, and there was no way you would meet him. But that was just a lovely little miracle. And Kendall yeah. said, I gave him my CTR ring. My parents gave me this beautiful CTR ring as I prepared for my mission. And I gave it to Elder Olama. And he said, I wonder if he was wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> probably, uh, right? Probably so. Yeah. Now, you, you speak a lot of the Congo. I do. Because that's where you were at. And, yes. But you seem to be replicating that experience across all of Africa. Is, is there a reason or in your experience something to say that this is – easy to say about all the other countries? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, as it happens, the Congo is not as, as developed as the others, although it should be the furthest ahead of any. Uh, is As far as natural resources go, it has more than anyone. It's dealing with political corruption where the distribution is just not there. Foreigners come in, take out all of the metals. Uh, in fact, your cell phone probably at some point originated in the Congo because the metals were mined there by the Chinese and they are a significant presence there. Okay. And so your cell phone may say made in China, but the actual metals used for the wiring, that's from Congo. So all yeah. of this wealth is going to other countries and people in high authority are getting paid. The people in the middle are selling eggs, shining shoes, you know, setting up their tiny barber shops. So, yeah, there, po- poverty is an issue. Uh, obviously, some some diseases are issues. The fact that I, I heard this morning that people were saying we should not let anyone from S- West Africa come into the United States because of Ebola. That's the sort of a thing that just boggles my mind. 
the the idea that uh, you know, granted, there have been some very serious cases, and there one was one case of the guy from Liberia who had been close to somebody who died of Ebola, and and you know didn't report it, and and that affected at least three people. But uh, the idea that we suddenly ban a continent, or at least a portion of a continent, because of a few cases of Ebola, that that to me says something about the fear that people have of Africa in general. The fact that when I tried to wire money to Emmy, and he was working for me, that, you know, I, I wrote a screenplay with him as my main consultant, because I'm very serious about having it be authentic. So when I would go to wire money with him, it, with Western Union, and I would say, I need to wire money to a man in Africa, the first it question was a would scam, be... scam, right? Yeah. The first question was, do you know him? Uh, yeah. And I, I admit that at one, one time I said, well, no, not really. He's a prince in Nigeria. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and, and it's, I I, actually, I, I kind of even feel bad for having played into that because it's a, it's a serious thing. Well, everybody Af- got those emails. We all did. And, right. and it's, it's not like everybody in Africa is, is doing that. And that's sort <laughs> right. of the perception that you can't, if it's from Africa, you can't trust it. And that, what a tragedy. Because when you actually meet the people and see how bright, how authentic and how passionate they are about their own future but the fact that they don't have the ability to get it one one of our friends was studying computer science without a computer only the textbooks this was a university hmm. course That's so hard. these yeah these are the sorts of things the desire is there the intelligence is there the resources themselves in the nation that is probably the richest in the world are not there getting back to a little bit more of the church aspect of this um one of the things that we, I don't want to say a perception of it, is there's a lot of people that look at this issue of race in the priesthood mm-hmm. and look at some of the things that have been said by leaders of the church in the past and have been offended or have used that as an element of enmity between them and their faith. Yep. And so it begs the question, when you have people like Darius and others that are, you know, the church is exploding— are they ignorant of this issue, or how do they come past it when they're the ones that really should be more offended? They transcend it. Uh, the, it, it. It depends on which voices you listen to. Okay. And the in the you mentioned an essay I wrote in for Mormon scholars testify where I talked about swimming and being in the deep waters. Yeah. There are all sorts of issues. Uh, race in the priesthood is one, and it's 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 a big one, and it's it's a, a difficult one because it wasn't just one leader who said bad things. Sure. It was a lot, and I uh, I think maybe the most important thing is to look at the recent statement, December. 13th, 2000, or December 6th, 2013th, under resources. It takes a little bit to get to it, but it is so important because it just flat out says these men were influenced by their culture. This was not a divine instruction. And then at the very end, it says the church disavows the whole idea of the curse of Cain or any kind of a curse, disavows any idea that blacks were less valiant in the pre-existence. Right. Unfortunately, that message hasn't gotten to everybody. But so much of what we do is we continue on in life. And if we decide that we're going to leave the shore and actually enter the waters and get to a depth where, where we can be in a place where we're seeing magnificent things, uh, is to say, I forgive the people for screwing up. I'm sorry. Is that all right that yeah, if I use that phrase? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Brigham Young said terrible things. So did Marky Peterson. And I, I'm old enough to remember Marky Peterson. <laughs> and it was actually kind of hard when I read some of the stuff he said because I uh, he was somebody who I had admired greatly. Uh, that doesn't mean that I expunge him entirely from my memory. But I acknowledge that he was human. I acknowledge that my grandparents were human. They also were in a racist culture. And the the, the challenge that we're given from, from the Savior and in all of the scriptures is to discern between the arm of flesh, the wicked traditions of the Father, and the pure truth of the gospel. Yeah. I actually want to speak to that because you, you give this story a little later on your Mormon Scholars Testify page. Uh, It's a story where your husband gave you a priesthood blessing at a particularly trying moment Mm -hmm. in your life. Do you remember this story? Absolutely. Okay. (laughs) I didn't want to make sure, I want to make sure we were on the same page. No, I I know exactly the story. Um, But I I, I want to read. I know exactly the circumstances. (laughs) I can can go back there, except that I 
we're talking about it now, and I'll let, I'll let you say what you're going to say, but I am now looking at it from exactly the perspective that my husband described. And I'm not going to go into the miracles that have happened in my family. I'll keep those private. But uh, this was prophetic. Well, let me, let me read the words that you put into that entry, and then uh, you can feel free to comment on, on it as, as you see fit. Uh, you said, I bless you. This is, what, this is the words of your husband, actually. Right. I bless you that your memories will be sanctified as the larger picture unfolds, and you will view all of the difficulties and trials you're enduring now with gratitude and love. And you said that this is the blessing of perspective. Yeah. That um, just still brings tears to my eyes. It's a beautiful phrase. In fact, it's, it, it seems to apply to a lot of things that we deal with when, when people encounter faith crisis or mm-hmm. challenges with their faith. Uh, you say that it, it not only illuminated your own personal history, but some of these hard historical Absolutely. episodes. Yeah. So wh- what did you want to comment on it with respect to your perspective now? Yeah, it, it just, just because that blessing was given to me, I think we were at the MTC at that time. So it's been five, six years. I, I don't remember when it was. I, I wrote the words down. Uh, and yeah, I was facing some extremely difficult problems, mostly with my children. But I was also writing books about black history. So sure. I was facing the very difficult things that people had said in, in the past. So I was facing misbehavior in my children and misbehavior in church leaders. Uh, my children were, were trying to figure out who they were. And honestly, the church leaders were trying to figure out who they as the church were. The paradigm that I tend to go to is the Lorenzo Snow that, that's not uh, it, when the prophet speaks, the thinking has been done. Oh, right. That we are, we began as an infant. We are maybe now about in our teen years. We're still learning. Well, we still are learning. Uh, we, we continue to evolve. The beauty of a dynamic gospel, which we believe, our progress is eternal. Right. We, and it's not, I, I've often thought of the word principle, uh, whatever principle of intelligence, and in Spanish, principio beginning. So you open a portal and all of a sudden you see a whole new vista of things to learn. But until you've gotten to that portal and opened it, you, you've you been just in the hallway and assumed that everything you understood about what probably was behind that portal was the, the case. Well, with, with race issues, people, of course, and gosh, let's go back to the Congo. Conrad writes The Heart of Darkness, which I intend to redo. Uh, <laughs> and great book. We Most of us read it. Did you read it? I Is, actually haven't read that one yet. Well, you should. Uh, I will, high school, I re- college, I've, and I've read it. it. I've taught it. Uh, brilliant book that portrays the Congolese as utter savages. Right. And the white man who falls for their ways as ending his life saying the words, the horror, the horror, because he has become like the Africans. That's the image that was was pervasive at the time that the church was organized. And then as we, we come into all of the issues with race and the Civil War, uh, civil rights and all of that, we still have that image of people with black skin being tinged with with just a deplorable attitude of they don't really belong here. They're a different species. And you put that on top with the justification for slavery, which was, well, we figured out that they're the seed of Cain and that the blessing, the curse that uh, Noah gave to via Ham to Canaan, right. that you will draw you will draw water for your brother and all of that. That was a prophecy of slavery. Therefore, we can enslave the Africans. So we're getting away from that. And all of the understanding is still in the portal. But then you open that vista and your perspective has to change. Because if you are seeing with your eyes the way they need to be, you are seeing your brothers and sisters, and you see nobility. You you see greatness that you had never imagined. I with with this, I um, I think I've Guatemala is another of of my mm. home territories. I I just returned from there. Man, you're a world <laughs> uh, traveler. I I am. I'm not teaching this <laughs> semester, so I'm I'm having lots of fun. Uh, but my daughter and I went, and and uh, my daughter did a concert for a school there. Uh, uh, she was a celebrity. Uh, oh, you know, I think I saw pictures on Facebook of that. Yes. I, oh, I okay. I I yeah, deluged did. Facebook That's... with pictures of my daughter. Um, but when we were there, I was there with two of my children back seven years ago. I took them to the house of a man named Pablo Choc, who I knew back in 1975 
I knew his son, who was the first Kakjikel Indian missionary. I went to the son's farewell. The son died after the big earthquake in, in 1976. Mm. I won't go into detail about all of that, but the it was the tragedy that Pablo Choc suffered was beyond comprehension. In the quake, he lost his pregnant wife and two children. Wow. A month later, he lost Daniel. And I took my children to visit Pablo Choc. I, I knew what a great man he was in the most humble circumstances you could imagine. And you could, you know, you can kind of kind of imagine a big tour bus with with people from America going to look at the ruins or whatever, seeing Pablo maybe carrying a load of wood on his back, okay. tump line to his forehead, and thinking what a colorful sight, that interesting Indian man, and not recognizing a king. Because as I stood with my children in front of that door, getting ready to knock. It was a just a, a tin door. I said, you are about to meet one of the great men on this earth. And we went inside. They were bothered because it smelled a little bit of the chickens. Oh, we, yeah. uh, we talked to Pablo. I love that my children saw me weep with him. They, you know, I, I speak a tiny bit of the dialect, Cachiquel, and I, I was speaking to him in languages that my children could not understand, which I got to do as a child of my father. I got to see my father speaking in languages I couldn't understand, but loving the people he was talking to. Mm -hmm. That is such a legacy. Uh, so Pablo, my husband joined us later, and he and I interviewed Pablo, and we talked about the quake and about Daniel's death and about when the missionaries brought Daniel's body to Pablo in a truck and just, and knocked on the door. It was one of the missionaries my father helped to learn Cachiquel, and uh, it was Elder Warnock. And and uh, he said, Pablo, I, hermano Choc, I don't want to tell you your son has been killed. And Pablo said, I wouldn't believe it until I pulled the sheet from his face. Mm. And then at the very end of the interview, after he's telling everything, the last thing he said was, yo guardo mis promesas, yo guardo mis promesas. I keep my promises. I keep my promises. This is a man who in the 1960s had saved up enough money to take his family to the Mesa, Arizona temple and be sealed. He had the passport picture of his family on the wall. One of the great men, but we as you know, Americans are ac accustomed to kind of seeing exotic other people or can be until we really enter the world uh, where, where they live and recognize how great they are. Uh, we, we can see them as curiosities. We can certainly see Africans and even African-Americans, except with African-Americans, often it's tinged with a, a sense of uh, they might – that that might be a hoodlum. That was oh. when uh, when uh, Daner, my, my director for, for this – for Heart of Africa, we interviewed him. Uh, during President Obama's election. And I, I know there are people who really don't like President Obama. I really like President Obama. I'll just be flat out with that. <laughs> but we talked to Daner about what does it mean to you as a black man to have, to have a black president? And Daner said, well, it means that when I go to the gym, people look at me and say, hey, he looks like he might be the president instead of, hey, he looks like he might be a thief. Uh, the fact that, that, that we do have issues of perceiving African Americans in a bad light is something that we need to address, and and it is significant that uh, that we have a black president. Well, I, I kind of wanted to get into your article uh, that you you do a lot of work with Pathios. Or I do I, a lot. Let's let's use a different term, I guess. Um, you, I, I you, work with it when I have the mood. There you go. <laughs> so you're on Pathios. Yes. And you have an article that you in, uh, wrote. I think it was back in May called the Welcome Table, or no, that's the Welcome the, Table my, is the name blog of your. My is called the Welcome Table. And I'm sorry, the 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 actual article is called Developing Spiritual Taste. Mm -hmm. So you remember that one? Yeah, I, I kind of do, but you'll probably have to remind me of okay. specifics. <laughs> well, the reason I bring it up is is originally what it came from, and I could tell that your world travels played into this, is that um, you've encountered critics or statements or perceptions mm -hmm. about the church. Yes. Um, and, and this perception comes from a lot of different cultures. Yes. And so part of the motivation for this article, and I would assume that in some cases it's a motivation for what you do, is to answer those criticisms or at least correct perceptions. Um, and you, you start off that article offering this brief anecdote it said, when, when I was in my late 20s, someone said to me, you're too smart to be a Mormon. Clearly I'm not, but the picture of Mormonism this person had in mind does not represent the kind of Mormonism I live. 
And when I read that statement, I thought, well, what, what is the kind of Mormonism that you live? I, uh, I'm a deep thinker. I'm a temple worker. Uh, I know the issues that can cause faith crises. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I can say I had a huge faith crisis. I, the blacks, because I was born in 1955, uh, I grew up with the priesthood restriction, and it did bother me. I dropped out of seminary over that because my seminary teacher said a terribly racist thing, and I just was completely uncomfortable. And so that was my one big act of, of rebellion as, as a young person was to quit seminary over, over that very issue. I've recognized the hand of God in my life in much. I, but I guess, honestly, I'm choosing to remember particular things and not others. Okay. I did go through a, a, a terrible marriage and, and got divorced. And I honestly don't remember that much of, of the bad marriage because I'm now married to Bruce Young who is the most magnificent husband you can imagine. You've had your memories sanctified. Yeah. And it's so, you know, when I'm thinking of my children who have been going through or, or are in faith crises, I, I allow them their spiritual journeys. I don't abandon them. Uh, and that, that has been my attitude so that they feel the space to make their own explorations. I also pray very hard for my children, and I do believe in things that some people would uh, call crazy. I do believe in the ministering of angels, and I believe that I have the ministering of angels, that angels minister to me personally and to my Why children. Why would you think that's crazy? Other, that's actually one of the things they list as indicating that you are insane. But I'm Interesting. I'm, <laughs> I mean, it's one of the things that the priesthood talks yes, about. absolutely. I and mean, I, the Aaronic priesthood specifically. I've, I've never seen an angel... But the experiences that I've had, one after another, and sometimes, well, honestly, <laughs> within the last three days, I've had miracles where things have just been put together in my life, and I've said, oh, okay, <laughs> that's, I guess I better take care of that. It is, for whatever reasons, I think one of the biggest reasons is that I did at one point just turn it over to God. Uh, that in, in the temple, I at one point said, please use my talents. Please uh, give me something to do. And that I've succeeded in not becoming bitter. That doesn't mean I haven't been tempted by bitterness, not so much by church history. I know that, and I forgive it. There's really nothing in church history that I don't know a whole lot about. My ex-husband was quite anti during the time that we were married, so I was very well aware of uh, what Gerald and Sandra Tanner were producing. I, I knew all of the issues from way back then, but they didn't measure up to my faith. Uh, they never challenged my faith, at least not that I remember. And I'm hey, I'm dealing with that's sanctified our... <laughs> memories. So now I'm just uh, I am astounded at the work that I see happening and at how many people are involved in all of this and the miracles that bring us all together. Yeah. Well, you talk about your talents. Let's move on to this movie, this big movie project that you've been kind of hinting to the whole time. So, what is it? And what's your involvement in it? The movie is called Heart of Africa, and it's set, surprise, surprise, in the Congo. Uh, and it began, I certainly didn't know it, it began the day that my husband and I were called into the MTC, and my husband was asked to be in a branch presidency in a French-speaking branch. The very next day, I met some of my the missionaries who would become my adopted sons. That's where it all began, but I could not have predicted anything. I was surprised. We you didn't recognize called. it as such. Oh, at the of course time. not. It was just this is going to be fun, uh, and I loved the kids. You know, they were my son's age and and sweet. Uh, sending them off to the Congo and then getting an email from one of them saying, "Hey, we're allowed to write friends, not just uh, family, so I can email you." And then I thought, "Well, if I'm emailing him, I'm going to email all of them." There you go. And uh, so, yeah, th thus it began, and then. That young man who said he could email was soon companioned with a young man from Zambia, Chiloba Chirwa. And I've had amazing experiences with Chiloba. One of the lovely ones is that I was able to connect him with artist Kirk Richards, and the two of them now have an exhibit at the BYU Library oh, very cool. uh, called From My Brother's Perspective, Zambian and American Portrayals of Scenes in the wow. Life of Christ. It's a, lo a lovely exhibit. Uh, and then I, I met Emmy, who, who became so important. So I... As all of this progressed and I got Emmy's story, the full story of his being a revolutionary and what he was taught in the revolutionary school, uh, he said, we were taught to hate. 
uh, and then him choosing to not hate. And that goes right into the choosing to not be bitter, even though you look at what has happened in Congolese history. Slavery back, you know, in the in the earlier centuries, but then uh, colonialism. But uh, you you have some of the most atrocious crimes against humanity happening during the reign of King Leopold II, with massive people being enslaved, their limbs cut off if they weren't performing up to speed on in getting rubber from from the rubber trees. It's it's a terrible history. Uh, there's a whole history of them not being allowed to choose for themselves. Hmm. So reason for bitterness, and that's I I would parallel that at least distantly to people who were bitter against Mormonism, especially if they've gone on missions and felt like I was persuaded into all of this before I knew the whole story. Uh, right. and, and M.A. felt, I there is there is more to this, and investigated the church, and then vowed as he began his mission, I will prove that black and white can get along. Uh, we complicate it a bit in, in the script, but I, I had that script down. We went to the Congo to start filming. We, you know, we had gotten some some funds. We are, by the way, starting a Kickstarter uh, Thursday, whatever next Thursday is. Um, so then we were in the Congo, and one of one of Emmy's friends says, "Do you know Hugh Matheson?" And I didn't. And he said, "Well, this is what Hugh's planning." And I looked at this whole big building, a huge economic center. I think they have ten acres or more uh, that they've already purchased. And that will help the reputation of the Congo and help the Congolese themselves to have an art center, which there are many artists who don't have support, so they can't do what they love. People who want to do film, theater, but they're not, there's not the ability no to train them. Right. Uh, well, what I mentioned about the guy wanting to study computer science, that's, that is yeah. across the board. Uh, and I looked at that and thought, we're not going to premiere our film in, the, in America. We're going to premiere it here. We're going to premiere it in Kinshasa. And then it went on from there because as we associated with the people, we realized we can film here safely. We need to have all of the papers taken care of. We stay out of the city centers where somebody could come after us, but we can film here safely. All along, I had said, oh, Congo's too dangerous. We'll go to Zambia to film. And then I suddenly said, no, it's right here. We're going to do it right here and we're going to premiere it here. And then we, uh, Dana and I went to South Africa, met with a couple of film teams and definitely decided which team we wanted to work with, mm -hmm. which is called Out of Africa, headed by Kweka Mandela, who is Nelson Mandela's grandson. And he is very much in his grandfather's vision. And we are, you know, you go down the things that they're trying to do with the whole concept of Africa rising. And it's exactly in line with what we want to do and what the movie is a part of. Uh, the movie is about a kid from Idaho who has never really seen a black person. Uh, and a former revolutionary. Yes, he is based on M.A., but he's a composite of a okay. number of, of other missionaries as well, African missionaries. All of the characters are composites. There's not one that is absolutely so this is based on a true story, not a real, not a right. true and, story. And uh, you know, I've, it's a feature. I've, it's not a documentary. I've, um, I've fictionalized a few elements, but a heck of a lot of the script is straight out of the emails that I got from the missionaries. So, but made to sound like very real conversation. Cool. But the whole conflict of, and I did have missionaries talk to me about serving their missions and realizing early on, I actually do feel prejudice against these people. And I can't do this work if I have that in my heart. It's got to be cleansed. So it's it's a journey through some of the difficulties of life in Africa, which it, it will include some illness and uh, you know other things, but a journey away from prejudice and towards forgiveness. Very cool. And when do you suppose that's coming out? We honestly we, we will return to Congo after rainy season. We had anticipated going back in December, but we talked to uh, Quaco's team and uh, to our friends in the Congo and and are aware that rainy season will impede what we're doing. So we're going back in May. We had planned on on premiering in November of 2015. That's I'm looking, ambitious. Oh, uh, yeah, but not that much. <laughs> We've, we okay. know what we're doing now. We, we know where we're going. We've already done the location scouting. We've got a lot of amazing B-roll. Uh, haven't cast it yet. Uh, so the big stuff, principal photography is yet ahead. But a lot of thinking of November was still, we're still kind of in rainy season. And we want to be filming in the time where we can get the very best light and all of that. Gotcha. So we, we may not premiere until May. And I, the timetable isn't as big a deal as me as doing it 
really, really well. We, we, we know that it'll be a good film because the story is so compelling. Uh, it's, it's much more a human story than a Mormon story, but because of the Mormon past with racial issues, and it does come up in the film where the white missionary has to understand that in the past, church leaders had said some really difficult things mm -hmm. about blacks. Because of that past, he is is going to have to go on on a journey as well, a, a, a spiritually, an interior journey. Uh, and the revolutionary, uh, the way I've put it, is a little different than it actually happened. A lot of the Africans are kept in places where they think are too dangerous for the white missionaries. So in this, as I did the script, I had it that this African missionary, Elder Kandu, has been only with Africans in Brazzaville and other areas where the whites don't go. And that for his very last transfer, for the first time of his mission, he's paired with a brand new missionary who's a white kid from Idaho who doesn't realize how strong his own prejudices are. Sure. And so there, you know, it's a huge invitation for cultural conflict. And, of course, it comes. And, and you know, we, we go through things that did happen to my missionaries. There was uh, one where Wigginton and Chirwa, Chirwa was my Zambian adopted son, uh, Chirwa came down with malaria and chickenpox, and they were quarantined together. I decided to reverse that and have it be the white companion mm. who comes down with the sicknesses and the African who gives him the blessing and stays with him during the time of quarantine. So, you know, you can— Dramatically, that's better. <laughs> oh, yeah. But remember, I taught creative writing for 30 years. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to that coming out, and and you have to come to with, Africa to see it first. But it, we will we'll bring it to. the Are you States. paying my ticket? Uh, I'd be happy to if that's the case. If, if you, I think it's if you make a ten thousand oh. dollar donation on Kickstarter. No, the truth is we uh, we submitted the film to a group called Independent Features Productions that accepts about two percent of the applicants. But if you're accepted, they provide a fiscal umbrella, so donations are tax mm. deductible. But they also allow Kickstarter. Well, that there was it is. so we we were accepted, and that was how we raised our enough money to hire the director and go to Africa to and do our door. B roll. So uh, people who want to donate like ten thousand dollars can have a tax deduction. But people like the rest of us who don't have that kind of money on hand can do Kickstarter. Excellent. Okay, well, I wanted to direct some people to a particular part of the uh, interwebs, if you will, uh, where they can find you, follow your, your writing on Pathos maybe, but certainly stay in touch with your efforts in putting together this film. Is there a place that they can go to? We have a Facebook page, Heart of Africa Film, uh, that, that, that they can go to. Uh, we've a, a lot of the kids who were my missionaries are there working with me. This is in many ways a family project, as gotcha. it were. Uh, and I've been in touch with about seven this week. So it's, as I said, long after I lined one of them up with his wife. Uh, so. Wow. Arranged marriage. So. Love it. <laughs> so we, we are still family. And, and this is a project that all of us feel very deeply about. Very cool. All right. So Heart of Africa Film on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And you have a personal website. Or would you like people no. to go to your Pathios uh, they can. I guess I, we we'll, we do have heartofafricafilm.com okay. for the film. I've never established my own website. I suppose I'll have to do that at some point. It feels a little arrogant sometimes, but it becomes I, then part I of— I probably won't because I really hate that. <laughs> I really I, I really. It just hate becomes the, part of it, doesn't it? Well, yeah, the whole idea of I'm so— I, I hate it when uh, the intros, where they, when I'm doing a presentation, they say we need information for intros— I got really – one time, Newell Bringhurst, who's a wonderful historian, great man, uh, was introducing me at the Mormon History Association, and he said, I'll need your bio. I gave it to him two minutes before he was going to introduce me, and it said, uh, Margaret Young swims butterfly. She is the president of the Newell Bringhurst <laughs> fan club and is looking for members. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. And he just made up something on the spot and gave me a little smile. <laughs> so, nice. Well, thank you again for coming on. I'm very excited about Heart of Africa and all the other stuff that you've been a part of in the past. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Articles of Faith with your host, Nick Galetti. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org. Tune in each Monday for another episode of Articles of Faith. 
Thank you for listening.